Hello everybody, welcome back to the Agostino Zinger Show episode number 153, Uno Cinco Tres, with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. How you doing? How you feeling? Oh, damn it, man. Happy morning. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening, wherever you are, man. It's Monday. Ugh, love a good Monday. Absolutely love a good Monday. Monday is my time to shine. Oh, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling flipping good, man. I'm super hyped, super pumped as per usual. You'd think I did like a whole rack of line, a line of something, right? But I haven't. I'm just hype and happy and ready to go because Mondays are a great opportunity for you to wipe the slate clean and get it started once again. God damn you. But now um, I feel amazing. I feel great. Monday is my favorite day of the week, as I've mentioned numerous times. This morning I went to the gym, didn't I? A little bit of gym work, and then this evening I'm going for a run. So I'm doing a double uh, this weekend or this week for the most part. I'm trying to keep that up for the five days until Friday, which is kind of party day. So I should be fun and ready to go. I keep coming back to that quote all the time that I've got up on my board: uh, "Discipline equals freedom." But it really is true, man. I tried to commit myself to five to six days of solid working out, good tight dieting, and then kind of go crazy on the weekend, and then kind of start again on the Monday, right? And by and large i found myself uh you know again more clarity of mind and of course at the end of the quote it, discipline equals freedom i do need to have the freedom to kind of like you know splurge uh guilt free on the weekend and kind of go a bit crazy and have some fun and then kind of get back on the wagon again it makes things so much easier i can't honestly imagine a life full of just like constant gluttony or constant or constantly kind of um, giving in to my ple- or giving in to my need for uh, mouth pleasure right um and sometimes i don't know again maybe people just like like they just like shitty food all the time but i like shitty food too like anyone right i could devour a plate of macaroni and cheese right now right but for the most part as, as much as i do love these oh phone's ringing there do i have to get let it ring out for the most part i do have to let it ring out don't i don't 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 care about the house phone when when your house phone rings at your house what do you guys do do you pick it up like for the most part every single person i think so when your house phone rings you do make you flinch don't you <gasps> who is that you get so worried, isn't it? But I remember when I was younger, living at home, when my house phone rang, we would sprint to the house phone to pick up first because it was probably your your cousins calling, uh, whatever, so an uncle that you like, an auntie you like. Nowadays, the house phone rings and you are worried. You don't know who the fuck that might be. It could be debt collectors. It could be someone looking to find your location so they can come and murder you for a window, right? It could be anything. It could be someone wanting to check if you're in so they can burst down your front door it's super nerve-wracking so you don't want to you don't want to kind of get involved on that end of the things but by and large here we are um so yeah uh, i couldn't imagine giving into 24-hour mouth pleasure right because again i just i don't know i don't know if i could if i could like shitty food forever right i'd have to kind of have some sort of balance in terms of kind of making sure i eat something nice or something like that's not as tasty so when i eat that thing that i think is tasty it tastes amazing that's the thing you realize when you on the diet, right? You realize straight away that your mouth gets a bit, it gets sensitive to sugar, especially if you stay off sugar for like a week and you jump back on it again. Like I remember that time I was um, on keto, I was in ketosis. Well, I was doing a keto diet for a good like two weeks, 14 days, like strict, no cutting corners, nothing. The first time I ate a biscuit, man, my mouth nearly exploded. Like, it was insane. I was like, shit. I said, that sugary. It was mad sugary. But you don't realize it when you don't eat it as often. When you eat it as often, you don't really realize it. You're like, oh, it's a standard. This is what every biscuit should taste like. But you put a chocolate hobnob in your mouth when you haven't eaten one for 15 days, it will blow up your fucking taste buds. So um, I find it really good for me. Again, personally speaking, because I know some people just don't can't do the whole dieting thing. I think it's a, it's a fucking punishment. But honestly, for me, I just feel life is much more easy, especially if you're working, man. Working Monday to Friday and eating whatever you want is just so tiresome, especially sitting in a chair, right? You're eating bread, you're eating carbohydrates, pasta and rice and shit again and again with fucking chocolates. You're getting that sugar high, then you're crashing in the afternoon. It's just tiring. I'd much rather have a bit of an empty stomach, uh, be much more alert and then by the week and then be able to kind of like, you know, stay up and, you know, stay up and work continuously throughout the day instead of just being, you know, like constantly in a state of fatigue. And then, you know, going home and eating shit again. And plus as well, for me, you know, being a being a hobbyist DJ, 
uh, and also being a bit of a nightlife enthusiast, right? I like to go out a lot in the weekends and go to like raves and see videos play. My body clock is a bit fucked up, right? Because I tend to come home after 2 a.m. So the last thing I need is to be eating like shit Monday to Friday and then getting a fucking hot wings on the way home on the Friday, right? On the Saturday home. But when I do that nowadays, I don't feel guilty because I've committed to myself to six days of healthy eating and working out five days a week. So then when I have that cheat day on a Saturday, it's okay if I can have a little hot wing on the way home, right? It's no big deal. But again, balance, balance, balance. Anyway, um, how's my weekend been? Or more importantly, how's your weekend been? Great? Good. Mine? Oh, thanks for asking. So my week has been fairly entertaining, to say the least. Uh, this Friday, I had the chance, I was given the opportunity, the privilege to DJ back in Dawson again. And um, as I mentioned prior in a few other podcasts, my relationship with Dawson has been very tumultuous, right? Very up and down. Uh, I played a big part in kind of, you know, uh, I played a big part in the whole nightlife scene a few years ago when I uh, co-founded this club night called So Special the alibi a few years ago that was probably one of the longest running club nights at the alibi for a while which is probably one of my favorite basement uh bars i'll ch- put a link in another video where i talk about it closing it's now gone so r.i.p the alibi it's no longer around but your memory will live on one of my favorite bars in the Dawson played there for a while and then did loads of other nights in fucking loads of other places around uh shoreditch old street blah blah, blah. was the general kind of man about town when that uh era was kind of popping and when it was kind of important to be that person right because i was you know getting involved in the nightlife scene wanting to be part of the of the culture in general or contribute something to the culture so i just wanted to take part and part of these and part of the things that you do to take part is to attend gallery evenings attend race store launches record releases whatever it may do and then slowly but surely you work your way up and you start getting involved putting on your own club nights which could then evolve to other things but you know didn't really for me so um, that kind of petered out quite badly towards the end um, I kind of felt like we kind of got uh, thrown away to a scrap heap because, you know, there was a cycle of new kids coming into the scene, which is, you know, it's, it's fine. Because as I mentioned a few times before, there's a study, I think there was a, something I read in a book about scenes rotating or scenes kind of, you know, respawning every four years or so. So for the most part, clubs and uh, bars and stuff have to kind of re... What do you call it? Uh, whatever, what's that word called reborn or whatever themselves right? reinvent themselves every four years or so in order to kind of keep themselves fresh and uh, we kind of see the same sort of thing with nest happening right they try, they kind of change their programming for the most part every four years because they have to attract more and more new students coming in um so by and large we kind of got left towards a scrap heap but then in that kind of like you know down period i kind of had a bit of an awakening and i kind of thought oh wow you know what no, Georgia down period, I still was going out a lot. I was still attending festivals. I was still going to club nights. And then I kind of realized in that kind of heady space that, wow, I actually love this music. I actually love this scene. I love everything about it. Um, it's not that, and I could, because at the time I kind of thought like, oh, maybe I was just in love with it because I was the main guy in the scene, right? I'd, I'd love it just because of the fame, quote unquote, right? But actually I love just being out. I love communicating with people at nighttime. I love kind of just hanging out. I love kind of listening to new tracks that I heard of, maybe a mix somewhere and hearing a DJ play it. I like visit and see my favorite DJ play in the nightclub in my area. I loved everything about it. So then I decided to think, you know what, how can I take part again? How can I be involved again? Because again, I, I don't like just being a spectator. I want to take part. I want to be in it. So I thought, fuck it, let me start DJing properly. Even though I was doing it beforehand at, at So Special, that was more like I was just DJing by proxy, you know, just to be the warm-up before like you know the night got started properly. But then during that process, I did kind of fall in love with it. And I was thinking, oh, I would love to do this properly, but you know, I was always playing the early sets. So I never really got a chance. Then, luckily enough, I bumped into... Oh, I got I, I kind of built up a bit of a relationship with uh, Natalia, also known as Afro Musa, who's another DJ who kind of DJs uh, with her partner, under the banner pleasures and they kind of brought me in for this new bar in Stratford that was opening up called tap east and they kind of let us put on our first night there called tap that we do every friday it was taking a bit of break for february but we're going to be back again later and um, through that process i've been able to dj every week which has got me you know which has made me a lot better as a dj it's not maybe it had made broadened my musical taste and all that sort of malarkey and then oddly enough through that process i started DJing in leytonstone and started doing loads of stuff around this area and, you know, I still had it back in my mind that, oh, it'd be cool if I could go back to Dawson and DJ, but I wasn't necessarily looking for it. I wasn't planning for it. I was just doing my thing. I think, you know what, I like DJ and, and people are paying me to DJ in this in this area. I'm just going to keep banging it out. You know, I can walk home after my club, after my fucking uh, DJ gigs, which is fucking insane. I'm loving life. And then little by little, slowly but surely, I was DJing in a few bars and clubs and, you know, get talking and you get familiar or friendly with people. 
And lo and behold, an ex-manager of another bar, DJ Leightonstone, has now moved to Free Compasses. And, you know, she invited me to play there a couple of times this month. And Friday was the first of the night. Uh, it's called Bumped. I do it. Oh, uh, Bump. Sorry, Bumped. Uh, bump out from the Free Compasses in Dawson Lane. Um, so the last one was last Friday. And this one's coming up on this Friday on the 8th. Uh, so I've got the flyer here, actually, for those of you that are watching via the YouTube site. Uh, so here it is. It's the flyer for Bump at the Free Compasses, starring myself, DJ Handsome Blackman, from uh, on the 9th of February from 9 till 12:30 a.m. Uh, by and large, it was a great success. This first one, I really enjoyed it. I think a lot of people came up to me and said I played really well. People were really happy with what I did. Uh, bar manager seemed happy with my gig as well. Um, I'd I'd be lying if I say I wasn't nervous. I was terribly, terribly, terribly nervous. Had super butterflies everywhere. So much so that I didn't really drink that much. I didn't drink at all prior to me starting sorry um which was n not really a thing that i don't do by and large i always kind of have a little pre-drink before but i was so nervous and went to such a good job that i kind of uh, forego any kind of alcohol there um and yeah man was so, so i was so nervous that on the way there i didn't listen to any music which is normally what i always do to get myself in state or to get myself in the mood i always kind of put on the tune and kind of you know sing along as i'm going to my dj gig but i was so nervous i didn't want any music in my i just wanted to be alone with my thoughts and kind of just like think it through okay how am i gonna do okay i guess you know what are you gonna do what are you gonna play first and then, and then, like thinking it through um i had meticulously prepared my playlist before i wanted to play similar to kind of stuff i play at tap east but i kind of changed a little the songs here and there and quite quickly i realized that you know what even though the set i did was good i still think i can get away with a lot more in dawson because i don't know just by just by the location it's a much more younger crowd they're a bit more um they're a bit more ready for that kind of music or music in general it's a bit more you know you know pushing the envelope a bit more I think at Tappies, the kind of conundrum I get stuck in is because that Tappies is in Westfield, Stratford, Stratford Shopping Mall, for the most part, the people that come in there are like after work people and people that are shopping. And they don't necessarily want to hear the best, the top 50, you know, best house tracks out at the moment, right? Probably no one does for the most part, but they don't really want to hear, you know, 120 BPM music. They want to just, they want to be in an environment where the music is good, but they don't notice it, right? And then by, by towards the end, when it comes up to about 11, no, 9, 10, 11, you can then start getting into your groove. But you have to kind of be careful uh, to not kind of disrupt their flow from seven until nine. So I kind of very cognitive and very aware of that. So I tried to kind of come in a bit soft. I tried to do the same thing at at, uh, at the at uh, the free compasses, and I don't think it worked that well in the beginning. I think I need to kind of come in a bit harder. I can't get away with doing that. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just try and take this opportunity. You see, as I'm DJing at three different places, Tap East. Um, the Heathcote style, Leighton Stone, and now the free compasses in Dawson. I'm gonna take the opportunity to kind of curate three different playlists for each location that are kind of site specific, right? Things that kind of I feel would work best for that kind of crowd, and then that will kind of then hopefully uh, grow me more as a DJ and help mold the kind of sound that I want to play over if I do end up getting booked for another bigger establishment. But overall, it was a great night. Had a lot of fun. Um, so happy to hear people kind of had a good time too. A lot of people come and congratulate me, saying I did really well. Which again, you don't really look for these kind of things. That's something that you're kind of looking for, but it's always good to get some sort of positive affirmation. And just, it was quite gnarly, man. I'm just saying again, really gnarly to kind of be in Dawson again, but on my own terms, right? Like back again, not underneath any cool guy, uh, kind of bandana, not under any, what, well, figuratively and uh, actually, like, you know, like bandana kind of vibe. Just being myself, being a good DJ, going there under merit. No kind of bring in, no kind of co-sign, just like someone that liked me before at another bar say, hey, come play here. I manage this bar now. No sucking anyone's dick, just like, just pure, just on just a skill alone. And that's amazing. And uh, yeah, I'm hoping that over time I'll be able to introduce some, some other, some newer sounds to my set. And I'll hopefully be able to craft my own little space and be able to show that, yeah, I'm as good as all the other people that are DJing in that scene because I think I am better or as good as some of these people that have been playing there for ages and ages. But again, I took a lot of time. I took time away. I stepped away from the scene. I wasn't really involved. So by you know, if they are going a bit further than I am in terms of career and they get into better places or whatever it may be, that's all good. No problem. I'm just going to keep working, put my head down and work and work, 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 work. But um, it's interesting to see how much better I've got since playing at Tapis, right? Because on paper, Tapis, again, is one of those locations where no one really want to play. It's a kind of a weird crowd. You have to kind of, you know, you, we've kind of earned our respect over time. But there is something to be said. There really is. It's probably stating the obvious. But there is something to be said for playing out every single weekend. You can't help but get better. There's no way that you cannot get better as a musician, as a performer, whatever it may be 
playing every weekend. There's no way you cannot get better. And with DJing, it's that one of those weird professions where you can't play every day because bars and clubs don't really like DJs every single day. For the most part, if you live in a busy city, maybe you could get away with playing at a, at a spot from Wednesday to Sunday. But for the most part, it's Thursday to Sunday. Um, and most people won't want to play these only Friday to Saturday. So it's difficult to get gigs in the first place because you know, London is you know one of the probably places where there's probably a load more DJs in London than there are bars that need DJs, um, especially with all the new licensing law things that are coming in. So it's hard to get spots, right? But it's only hard if you're looking at the places that are cool, right? So Dawson and Shoreditch, they're amazing, they're great. Uh, but there's too much competition there. There's too, there's too many people fighting for the same kind of, you know, crumbs, so uh, so to speak. Not to say the positions are crumbs, just to say, you know, there's too many people in there fighting for the same positions. So the thing to do is to pull away from there and go to other places and try and get your, build your reputation up that way or try and hold your skills that way, right? It requires a lot more work. It probably requires you having to buy equipment because most of the places you're going to go to won't necessarily have a PA set up uh, that can kind of accommodate a DJ. So it's going to require a bit of investment on your side, maybe investment on the bar end side. You might have to do a proof of concept and kind of maybe do the first one for free. There's lots of things you can do approaches wise in terms of kind of getting involved, but that is probably the best way to do it. So they go to all the places that all the other DJs play at, go to another area that also has a big kind of like, you know, caches or bars and people that go out to have drinks and then set up a bar or set up a DJ booth in that kind of arena and then build yourself up that way. Of course, on the other end, you're not going to get the exposure you probably want because I, I did notice in Dawson when I played it in the, the other day, I did notice in the space of like an hour or two, I got I gave my number to three or four people who wanted me to play at their party or their wedding, whatever something may be. So whether or not something anything comes of it is, is, is neither here or there. But the point is that you obviously get a lot more opportunity to impress people who might be able to put you in another position playing in Dawson because naturally all the people that you'd want to uh, help you out in your career quote unquote live in that kind of area right or they go out in that kind of area so that you can kind of lose that connection lose that ability to kind of play in front of the people that you want to play in front of because you're out of the area but if you're only concentrated about being a better DJ being a better performer you have to be able to go on stage. You just have to. There is no other excuse for it. Because I noticed even for myself, like I probably recorded more mixes in my bedroom when I worked when I was DJing in Dawson, or when I wasn't DJing as often. Uh, but now I probably play out more often than I do record DJ, record my sets, and I'm a far better DJ. But I always used to think that oh no, I'm improving because I'm playing at home. But you're not because you're playing for a crowd of low for a crowd of one right you're not getting the reception you're not getting that feedback loop you're not being able to see who's tapping their feet who's bobbing their heads who's leaving uh who's kind of like not dancing anymore you're not being able to read the crowd anymore you're not going to be able to get an, an understanding of what works when blah 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 the only way to do that is to be on stage so um i think for any aspiring dj out there if you are kind of in two minds or what to do you're not sure oh, i don't know what to do here or there blah blah, blah i would encourage you I would encourage you, I would encourage you, wherever you may do, wherever the crowd is going, or wherever so no, super popular in terms of DJs, don't go there. Go to another direction. Find another area, wherever city you live in, wherever town you live in, and try and set up shop there, because obviously you'll be able to play more often. You might even get paid more often. But the most important thing is that you'll be able to play more often. You have a captive audience that you can kind of build over weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, and then slowly but surely, once you're improving your skills, you can then start recording your sets, sending them out to more bars and Clubs, but regardless use that as your main base and then build out from there but don't don't aim for the stars first try and get your base try and get your spot you can go to every single week to play and that will improve you far quicker as a dj than playing in front of a bunch of uh cool people who necessarily won't are only going to hire you once every three or four months which isn't it good enough in order to kind of get you where you need to get to uh so that was my weekend for the most part and again like i said i'm, I'm dj again this friday uh at the free compasses in dawson the fly is there if you guys want to see it uh bump uh, with myself, handsome black man, at the free conferences on the eighth of February, nine p.m. until twelve thirty. So uh, that was me in that weekend. Um, what else has been happening? I think that's it for the most part, isn't it? Right, stayed in on a Saturday, stayed in on a Sunday. Kind of, you know, again, I think old man syndrome is kind of kicking in. 
you know, you can't necessarily go out back to back weekends and stuff. And, you know, by and large, but, well, actually, no, when I came back from Bump, I stayed for a couple of, I stayed for an hour or so, got another drink at uh, the Free Compasses, which is, again, one of the great things you can do with DJing, right? It's the whole, like, after hour thing. It's probably the best thing, hanging out with the bar owner, hanging out with the bar manager, hanging out with their friends. It's probably the best thing you can do afterwards. So I did that for an hour, about an hour. And then I kind of, you know, walked back home slowly. It took me a while to get back home. I was going to take an Uber, but I thought, you know what, for the first time playing here, I want to see what it feels like to go on public transport and the next time i might do an uber so uh just to see how long it'll take it took me about an hour and a half to get back home um luckily the journey wasn't that bad i took like the overground which is the only one that runs from dorston junction all the way into canada water and then took a jubilee line from there to stratford so that was fairly simple um but one thing i noticed that um, i think a lot of people have been mentioning it maybe because of their program has really improved and they're maybe aiming at a certain demographic but a lot of people go to Primworks, right? Or is it just me? I'm seeing a lot more people talking about Primworks. When I was at Tacney, I saw a lot of people talking about well, a group of friends going to Primworks. And then when I came back home from the Jubilee line, I bumped into some people that were gurning out of their minds, whatever. But they were they went to Primworks too and had a blast of a time. Uh, Primworks is one of those venues that popped up during the whole like Lions City Law thing. And just, oh no, popped up when the 24-hour tube was coming into play. And the whole idea behind it was that they were going to have this club uh, that was opened up, I think, in a former like print works factory, essentially. Um, and obviously, to accommodate the printers in the, I think, you used to print newspapers back in the day. It's kind of shaped like a long rectangle, so it's quite, you know, it's not really, it's not something you'd be used to from a clubbing environment. Usually, clubbing environment, especially warehouses, they usually rect, they're usually like square shaped, right, quite wide. But this is really long and, and narrow because obviously it's a former uh, printing uh, factory. And the idea behind the print works was that they were going to open a space where it was going to be open from like 12 p.m. in the afternoon until uh, half 11 at night. And the idea behind it was that people could go home. It'd be like a 24 hour club, but people could go home before the last tube ended. Uh, now, I think they've changed the times and they're kind of doing it a bit earlier. Sometimes I've seen nights start at 3 p.m. I've seen 6 p.m. But essentially, they can fit. They can basically uh, have DJs play extended sets like four, three, five, four, three, four, whatever hour sets or six hour sets, similar to what they might do in mainland Europe, in England, and still people can still go home at a respectable time. But I'm seeing loads of kids going there now. I think it's kind of really popped up the last few months or whatever it may be. I know the London Warehouse Projects, London Warehouse, is it London Warehouse Projects or whatever, the electronics, whatever that. LWE, that promotion company, I know that they've kind of pulled away from uh, Printworks and they're not programming as often as they are now. They've got other pro they've got other promoters in to kind of do the programming. And so far, so good, man. I think uh, the one just passed, I think uh, Nas Nastia was playing, DJ Nas Nastia, uh, who's kind of really good on social media. She's always on there crying or complaining about a set that went bad or talking about a set that went good. She's probably one of the best kind of uh, DJs on social media at the moment. So I recommend you check, check her out, DJ Nastia. Uh, and then I think she was also playing alongside Eats Everything and uh, the Green Velvet, I think, this Friday just passed. I think they've got another, a few other good club nights coming in. They had a really good disco one, I think, on Friday too. Um, I think a horse meat disco and a few other people are playing. So pretty much it seems like it's popping up a little bit. Um, I might have to go visit it because I still haven't been yet. I saw the video of Bicep playing live the other day. And that was insane. The light show that they did was really good. I know uh, Skepta did his SK... Oh no, did he do SK1 level or SK1? launch there or something or was it Eskimo? I don't know what it was but uh, Skepta did the performance there recently performed live uh, there that, that looked great too um, so far I've seen some conflicting reports about the space about the, the shape it is I've heard sometimes it can be a little bit hard to find a spot to dance because it's all really jammed up together in one place in that one rectangular spot but if you go somewhere with, with all the room then the sound doesn't really necessarily carry over there uh, but by and large, I like the idea, man. I think it's a quite a pretty cool concept and a good way to kind of circumvent all the kind of draconian licensing laws that we have in London at the moment. Anyway, um, with that being said, let's dig into some topics. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. What have we got here? So, number one, 21 Savage is getting deported. This news broke um, over the week, oh no, sorry, over, well, last year, last night actually, kind of come, out, come about, which is quite shocking to a few people. So supposedly the story goes that um, 21 Savage was 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 uh, on his way to watch the Super Bowl, whatever, like Super Bowl weekend, hanging out with his mates as you do. And he was supposed to be targeted by ICE, um, the immigration um, or whatever. What does ICE stand for? Immigration question? What does ICE stand for? I don't know. Let's check it out. What does I stand for? Uh, blah, blah, blah. What does I 
stand for? Oh, come on, load. Stand for, let's see. Da, 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 da. Oh, okay, yeah. I stands for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. So, yeah, um, I don't know why they were targeted during the weekend, but it's a bit, you know, it's a bit crazy. So it means that maybe... Anyway, let's just give an overview of the story. Tony Mon Savage gets pulled over in a car. His friend who is meant to be deported or something along the lines of Young Nudie, he's the one that the, the, ICE, the ICE officers were kind of targeting. Along the way, they kind of found Tony Mon Savage. They booked him too. He popped in the system. And supposedly the story goes that he actually moved to the States when he was 12 years old. And before that, he was actually brought up in the UK by by the way of Dominica, where his parents are from, um, which then made him look like a UK citizen. And then he kind of made his way from uh, London to the States when he was 12, which is weird because I've never heard this story ever in the history of 21 Savage being around. I never heard it right that he was actually born, for the, born in the UK and he went to um the states just before he turned to a teenager so uh the kind of the story evolved from this kind of ongoing thread that was happening on the so on social uh via the ice agents which is a bit worrying but essentially um so the first couple so the first kind of tweet went out um an ice spokesman said the following brian cox said this right uh u.s immigration and customs of enforcement arrested an unlawfully present uk national um Shaya bin Abraham Joseph, aka 21 Savage, uh, during a target operation with federal and local enforcement partners early Sunday in the in Metro Atlanta. Uh, and then it says the following: uh, Mr. Abraham Joseph was taken into ICE custody as he is unlawfully present in the U.S. and also a convicted felon. Mr. Abraham Joseph initially entered the U.S. Uh, legally in July 2005, but subsequently failed to depart under the terms of his immigration uh, non-immigrant visa. Uh, more from ICE. Mr. Abraham Joseph is presently in ICE custody in Georgia and has been placed um, into removal proceedings before the federal immigration courts. ICE will now await the outcome of his case before a federal immigration judge uh, determines the future. Um, which is fucking crazy, right? That he's one in one in one instance he's going to go watch an he's going to go watch a football game and the next moment he's in like a fucking you know. He's in one of those cages that we saw the kids in on his way to get deported or being processed to be deported to come back to the UK, a place that he hasn't lived in for the best part of maybe 10 years or something, right? It's fucking crazy. I'm never sure if he even has any family over here still. Now, of course, it helps. Like, of course, he's a multimillionaire, but still, you know, he's got his whole family counting him in the States and they decide now to kind of pull him. Well, but the interesting part of this conversation is that he entered the States legally in 2005 and it looks like he maybe just didn't renew his papers. Um, or he didn't kind of go through the procedure needed in order to kind of get where he needed to get to in terms of having status. Or at that time, he had no inclination he was going to turn into this, you know, this huge, hugely successful rap artist, right? He probably thought he was just going to be a regular dude and it wouldn't have mattered probably. And I guess probably because he's such a high profile individual that maybe they targeted him because of that reason. Um, and it continues, it says here... Um, Blah blah blah. A nice person tells Twenty One Savage was taken to custody. His whole public persona is false. Uh, uh, he came to the US and UK and has been overstayed his visa. More coming, which is crazy if they actually said that. It's actually nuts. Even that ICE are giving press briefings, right, on high profile cases. They should be not giving any briefings whatsoever, which is fucking nuts, right? Anyway, it continues. Maybe because of all the bad press they got because of the kids in cages. Um, initially entered the US illegally in two legally in two thousand five. Um, but he became unlawfully present in the US when his visa expired in July 2006. So I'm assuming whoever was in charge of getting his visa sorted out didn't get that sorted. Uh, blah, blah. And then there was a breaking news here from, I think, update from academic to some of the lines of, uh, I spoke to him on Savage team. He saw situations a big misunderstanding and he hoped to get it cleared out quickly. There's logical explanation behind everything as well. But until then, let the jokes fly, which is true. There's been a lot of great memes on social about this whole situation that's been quite funny, but you know, taking away all the humour of it, it's a bit upsetting, really, for 21 Savage and his whole family. You know, he's come into a good space as of the last three or four years. He's kind of grown immensely in front of us. Um, I think we all kind of remember that really, um, you know, eye-opening interview he did with Breakfast Club, where he kind of sat down and held court and just basically explained why he is such a savage, right? He explained a kind of, you know, his brutal upbringing, the fact that he lost loads of friends close friends to a really you know really uh horrible circumstances loads of terrible shootouts where he was bleeding to death and his friend died and seeing his friend die in his arms like just horrendous stories right that made you think fuck you know this guy's had a hard hard life right um and then he suddenly becomes this huge successfully rap star 
um, people really appreciate his, the, you know, the the seriousness of his of his bars and how he approaches things, and then he kind of improves project in project out. He gets better and better and better. So much so now he's his most recent album, uh, I Am, uh, features a, a, an amazing J Cole verse, and you know he got the J Cole co sign specifically because he kind of you know he stepped away from all the glitz and glamour of the hip hop image and sort of like you know forego uh, wearing too much jewelry or wearing expensive clothes. And kind of, you know, spoke about ownership, spoke about getting his masters back, spoke about uh, building stuff in his local community. He was really on a good path. And then it seems like, you know, it seems like just when people are starting to get themselves fixed up, the cops kind of nab them. We see the same thing happen with Blueface, right? He supposedly got pulled over recently or arrested at a petrol station uh, because of some, 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 you know, some gun charge he had like a, a while back. But this is a good example, you know, someone that was quite wild in the past and then suddenly he starts to get on track, he starts to do things, starts to kind of get his career where he needs to go and then boom, they pull him up again. Uh, Takashi 6 9 probably got himself involved in something that he probably should have got himself involved in the first place. But we saw that in the same sort of way. And, you know, not one to be a conspiracy theorist, but Jesus Christ, man. But then on the other side, you have to say that for these kind of up-and-coming hip-hop guys, Hip hop stars and acts, whatever they may be, I think there used to be a lot more of a there used to be a lot more owners put into kind of getting their affairs in order before they step out in front of the camera, especially if they have aspirations to become a sub global star. I think we have to treat being a hip hop star the same way politicians have to treat about running for running to be the president of the United States, right? We see the same thing happen with Howard Schultz. Howard Schultz was quite an, uh, a well liked, well respected. A business individual right everyone kind of credited him with uh, the starbucks rise and it growing into one of the biggest kind of coffee chains in the world and now all of a sudden the moment he steps up and tries to throw his hat and ring to become president you know all of a sudden everyone hates him so you have to be very careful in terms of how you step out and, and when you step, down, step up and make sure you have all your affairs in order before people start picking out picking apart your statements and things that you said in the past and i think you have to hip-hop people have to do the same thing with themselves right they have to make sure that they've got all their charges solved and all these other things that they might have going on in the background done before they step out because you know by sh you know for sure hip-hop police are going to be on your back so it's sad to see for Tony Savage it's really upsetting on his on his side I'm sure his family are going to look going to be happy with the situation I'm sure for the UK people's jokes are going to fly I'm sure even people at Wireless are probably inquiring the situation seeing what's happening there because you know the opportunity to get someone as big as Tony Savage to come perform there would be crazy but also it's must it's absolutely nuts that somebody hasn't lived in the UK for nearly 10 years He's going to now supposed to be getting deported back because he overstayed the visa. It's like, what? Especially someone as high profile as he, as he is. You could maybe, you know, use, maybe on the, in their side of it, they want to use him as an example, but there's also ample evidence to see that he's, you know, he's contributed so much to American, uh, the American economy, you know, by and large, by the amount of tickets and albums he's selling and the amount of paid in taxes. And also uh, socially too, right? The idea that he's, you know, the, the way he is and he's kind of preaching this alternative message to the kids coming up about not wearing jewelry, about maybe not doing as many drugs, about owning your masters. That's something that's a, a, probably more worthwhile at home than it is in the UK. Um, but you know what do I know, man? But yeah, this case continues. I'm, we're gonna keep an eye on on the updates will probably be pending uh, across the next few days and stuff. But I'm eager to see what happens next in this interesting case with 21. Um, next on the docket, we have the Hoka Wan, Hoka Wan, Hoka Wan, Hoka Wan. These trainers have been absolutely everywhere, haven't they, the last um, few uh, seasons? I think they kind of maybe rose to prominence, would you say, off the back of the Triple S's? Maybe. Um, I, I'm sure uh, Kiko would probably argue against that. You know, he's always trying to tell people, he's always trying to remind everyone when, when he was wearing these first. But um, I'm sure we might have seen Hooker 1 trend maybe before we saw the triple s's from bless Yaga. i'm pretty sure we probably did but but anyway because because of the, the the kind of upsurge of chunky trainers and chunky sneakers in general there's been a everyone's trying to look for the next big thing to wear what's the kind of thing everyone's going to wear i'm seeing a lot of people wearing the etsy or etsy's they've been everywhere for the most part i've seen people wearing loads of buffalo sneakers i'm seeing people wear a lot of the technos uh from uh nike and shit but what i've really liked model wise has been the the hooker ones especially the trail the Hooker One Trails, right? Yeah, Tall Trail or the Tall Ultra Trail. 
they did a really good collaboration with these um i'll get them up on screen they did a really good collaboration with these um with engineered garments they did a whole colorway um they did i think no two colorways i think they did like a sand and an all black pair that i think a lot of youtubers have been wearing that look fucking amazing um and then the kind of shoe oddly enough that work really well with really um kind of dressed up looks and really casual looks. I've seen people wear these with like really smart pleated trousers. I've seen people wear these with jogging bottoms, with chinos and shit. It's one of those really oddly versatile shoes that works really well in both cases. And of course, for the for the kind of like, you know, quintessential streetwear kind of urban explorer guy, these are probably the perfect shoe to wear because they look as good as they would look in a business meeting as it would look on a night out with your friends. And uh, Hooker have kind of, um, or Hoka have kind of introduced loads of new colorways and um, they look great. They're all kind of in the same sort of model with a tall ultra low it looks like some brushed way there the general sort of construction by and large people i've seen on youtube talk about them they're, they're fairly light they're uh, compared to what they look like um, i'm not sure who the creative director is at, at uh, hooker one is doing is introducing all these kind of more uh street level um models but whoever's doing it is doing a fucking incredible job whoever's kind of like steering the ship there over there because again these colorways are amazing so we've got like an olive colorway that i've just previewed here on the screen that looks fucking great then we've got this blue sort of like is it do we say we say blue yeah say it is blue it's also green is it yeah we've got a blue suede uh finish here again i'm liking it it's completely all one color even the midsole everything everything's um tonal which looks fucking awesome with a vibrant soul uh we've got the completely black colorway that i'm sure is gonna be really popular with people that missed out on the engineer garment shoe because it looks very similar to that and by and large just like fucking great great model i think they did a fucking awesome job with these um they're due to come out when i think they're priced at 265 us dollars which is about what 200 quid uh no release date set oh actually release date for the first of march at the moment they're quite hard to get i think um, the, the site isn't the best um the hooker one site i gotta be completely honest um i'm not sure if they're gonna um redo it or they're gonna have another kind of like offshoot site that kind of deals with the people that want to buy them for the streetwear looks per quote unquote but it'll be cool if a lot more accounts like picking them up because you know they're quite hard to find to buy retail for the most part you have to buy them i've seen a few people buy them through ebay especially the boots that people like or no through amazon sorry um, I see people will buy them directly from the site, but the site only deals in euros. And it's a bit odd in terms of where you're going to post them and they're going to get shipped from the store. I don't know. It's a bit weird how the, sh the shopping experience isn't the best. So I'm hoping that more accounts pick them up, number one. And I'm also hoping that maybe they are able to kind of create like a maybe another miniature website on online store that kind of caters to the streetwear crowd, to the crowd that's kind of made this model popular in the first place. That would be great. Or maybe even generally have a pop-up store somewhere. That would be fucking awesome if they could do that. So if anyone in that hook or hook one team is out there and you have those plans in mind please let me know so i can share with my viewers but yeah the shoe looks amazing it's the hooker one it's the hooker one tall ultra low and uh, that seems like four colorways right you've got the olive you've got the blue you got the sand no olive blue and black right yeah three colorways and they look fucking amazing um due date is the first of march uh retail probably about 200 quid but they look awesome next on the docket what do we have here uh, yeah, uh, the, yeah, six nine, please guilty. Um, we all we all we knew this already, and I've kind of mentioned it maybe previously in, my, in another episode I spoke about. Uh, but six nine has pled guilty. I think to nine cases overall. I think the writing was on a wall when he kind of when he was moved. Uh, when he moved when he got moved prisons, right? Do you remember the first when he got first arrested? The first couple of weeks he got moved to another secure facility, and immediately when people heard this, they kind of first they kind of knew straight away that he was going to be snitching on his uh fellow co-dependents or co-defendants. And then when uh, we heard that story about Shotty coming into court and saying something along the lines of like, oh, we're Treyway, we never bend, we never fold, shout it out. We kind of assumed that was kind of directed indirectly to 6 9 maybe because he got wind that 6 9 was going to be corrupting with the feds. And the fallout to this is fucking insane. He had an amazing year. He went from zero to 100 in the space of a year. And then it kind of all kind of fizzled out um, in an amazing fashion. Well, in a kind of quite... Well, amazing in a, in, a, in a worse sense for him. And you're hoping it's going to be a lesson learned for the kids coming up. But I don't think it is. I think in the same way that I mentioned about that girl, uh, Crystal, whatever, that girl that got Harry Styles tattooed on the side of her face, right? I think there's some people out there, some kids coming up in the entertainment industry who kind of think that any attention is good attention as long as people are looking or uh, absorbing your art and what you're putting out there into the social media space. 
So I'm sure for some of these people, they're probably going to think, you know what? No, fuck it. I'm going to do it anyway. It doesn't really matter, right? I'm going to do what I want to do, get myself what I need to get to, and then kind of from there build. I would say no. I would say it's probably not worth it. I'd say you probably you shouldn't do something like that. But again, what do I know? I think in the long run, concentrating on your actual artistry is maybe the best way to go about things. But I'm sure there's probably a lot of kids out there who are probably looking at the 6 situation and think, you know what? If I could do maybe 10% less of the madness that he done, in terms of involving myself with street gangs, all that malarkey, and still garner the same amount of attention by trolling, I think kids would do it in a heartbeat. We've seen a few people kind of copy the same sort of model uh, coming up now. We're going to name no names, but I think in, 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 the, in, the, in an era where people are kind of like, you know, keep communicating this lie that there's too much media out there and it's hard to cut through, I think people are going to use any kind of uh, you know, tactics they can to kind of break through and to kind of cut through the noise. And unfortunately, the sixth situation is going to be one of those examples for it. Um, one of the saddest situations that come out of it, effectively, is the is the case of the baby mother, right? She's been caught up in this whole story, this whole shitstorm from the moment that, you know, you know they, of course, 6 9 and this baby mother weren't actually together romantically, but, you know, she had to be publicly embarrassed, quote-unquote, by 6 9 him kind of parading around his new girlfriends or new female company here and there on social media. Then she kind of got dread through the mud for being accused of, you know, maybe uh, sleeping with uh, one of Six Nine's best friends in terms of Shotty, who was also his ex manager. And now, you know, through the whole idea of maybe Six Nine is snitching, we're not sure if it is true. Allegedly, he is. But if that is the case, then now she's going to be put under the, the microscope again because, you know, her, effectively her family is coming under, is coming, uh, is in, you know, is in danger because Six Nine is now cooperating with the feds. And that's one of the, that's a part of the story, similar to the, you know, public shame that you see on, online. That's part of the story that no one really talks about. The idea that you know the collateral damage of one person's decision right there's un there's a unintended there's the unintended consequences of you kind of going out there and doing what you're doing and you know there's a there's a actual footage of here from her talking about it on tmz that i'm going to play a little bit of it so you guys can see but it's quite sad to hear her speak about a situation by and large but this is kind of her point of view regarding the whole situation the play my Reaction initially, I just think it's disappointing. How come? Um, cause I expected way more out of the situation. It's just sad, honestly, to see all these men dragged into something that's really ugly. I've mm -hmm. been with him seven years and the fucking, the fame that he's had within a year, the success, it's just sad to see how it's going now is just disappointing and it's sad do you feel that you and your daughter are at risk and that maybe is the probably the point of the matter right it's the fame that's probably the issue that's probably what kind of fucked him over in the end of it it was the chasing of the fame he wasn't necessarily whenever you heard him talk brag about his billboard hits or whatever it was more so a justification of how big he was right we don't necessarily know how big he was but justification right you got he kept you get um billboard hit billboard hit billboard hit um but it wasn't necessarily a pursuit of the artistry. He didn't want to become the best rapper alive or the best musician alive or the best entertainer alive. It was all about the fame, wanting to be known, wanting to be known. And I guess coming from a place of depravity, coming from a place of having nothing, I guess when you have nothing, quote unquote, the idea of fame is that it's going to get you out of your situation. It's going to allow your family, family and family, family to never suffer from poverty ever again. But I think by and large, when you enter the entertainment space, when you enter the artistry space or when you want to be a musician, I think what actually guarantees the financial security of your family is concentrating on becoming a better artist, right? It's concentrating on it making sure your sound evolves throughout the years, throughout the decades, so that you can continue doing this until you're old and grey and people actually want to hear what you have to say and you garner new fans along the way. That's probably one of the things you want to do. And I guess a fixation of fame is only going to get you here. Now, that's not to say everyone's going to end up in prison, but I think focusing on fame is going to is going to effectively take you off course. You're going to end up doing things that you probably never thought you would end up trying to do because you're chasing this fame thing that is so fleeting, right? Because who's to say, even if he was out, that his whole his whole buzz would have not died after a year anyway, right? Because it's so fickle, it's so fleeting the idea of fame. You have to always be in the pursuit of actually perfecting your artistry and that will effectively keep you out of madness because when you focus on your artistry you won't care about running away with nitrate blood you won't care about uh trolling 
uh, Chicago goons. You won't care about all that shit. You'll just concentrate on being in the studio, knocking out song after song, getting albums out, performing on stage, touring all over the world, and connecting with your fans. That's all you're going to care about. Um, in a sense, yeah, absolutely. He left. He did what he did. He made his bed. Now he has to lie in it. But he didn't think of how it's it's going to affect others. He's only thinking about himself in the situation. So I mean, I'm left to pick up the pieces of whatever mess he he's made, which is which is and has always been a thing. That's that's the saddest part for her isn't it? and his family in general. You heard that a lot. You've heard that even with the um, with the El Chapo case, right? Um, effectively, the only person holding El down El Chapo is the mother of his children, right? The young, the young, attractive young, the young lady who's kind of been praying herself all over social and it's kind of been one of the star witnesses of the cases. But every person he worked with previously, people who, who El Chapo made millions of dollars with, have all of a sudden turned on him and kind of are snitching on him, telling all their stories. But the people that are having to pick up the pieces. Uh, the parents or the family, the aunties and uncles, but usually it's the females in the situation that are the ones having to kind of hold the family together. And in this case, with as the six nine allegedly snitching, you never know what the consequences are going to be. We're hearing stories that six nine is you know spending and god ungodly amounts of money to make sure his mother is safe and make sure mum is out of harm's way because you know him cooperating with the feds might lead to consequences on the streets, which we're hoping that doesn't happen. But there is a it's a common thing I'm hearing in terms, even in the you know in the high up drug circles, right? That people just get into this life, they know exactly what the rewards are, they know exactly what the consequences are, but they still, when they when push comes to shove and they're under pressure, because by and large the, the federal the, the federal bureau, the federal agents for the most part, um, the information, most of the good information comes from people actually snitching. It doesn't come from the investigations because if everyone actually abides by the code of no snitching, right, and uh, having that honor amongst their men. Then no one would any, no one would ever be caught unless people make mistakes, right? But by and large, no one would ever get caught in that respect. People just do their time silently and kind of get out um, with their uh, dignity and their honor still intact. But with federal agencies whacking people with fucking you know f- f- triple digits sentences, people are getting really nervous and quaky and kind of thinking, you know what? Fuck that! I actually don't want to spend uh, all my waking years in this hellhole when I've been used to living a life of luxury I'm going to snitch on my friends and make sure that I'm okay so he's a bit selfish in that regard he's probably not thinking about his family but he is in some respects so he's hoping that you know if he can if he can work out a deal with the with the feds he can maybe reduce his sentence but I'm not sure how much more they can reduce it to supposedly he's looking at 47 years I'm not sure him cooperating is going to bring it down to less than double digits it's still going to be a long time to be in prison and I don't think he has the same amount of rapport or good will that someone like a Bobby Schmurder would do where people would be waiting for him to come out. I'm not sure it'll be the same thing with um with Six Nine, but you know, that's less that's that's neither here or there. If he uh, came back to you and said he wants a relationship with his daughter, how would you feel about that? I don't feel like he's in the space right now. Mm-hmm. And so I feel like he he's in a space in life and a solid situation, I I can't feel comfortable allowing him to bring whatever he has with him into my daughter's life. That my job is to protect my daughter at all costs. And even if that means him. And essentially that is there. That's where we left that, right? Like that's the saddest part, right? She's still leaving the door open for six nine to come into her daughter's life, of course, because he's the father of a child. But you know, that's the consequences of this kind of lifestyle that people don't talk more about, right? There's a little daughter involved in this. There's a baby mother involved in this that's been accustomed to a certain, you know, to a certain quality of life that I don't know where that income is going to come from now. There's a family that's support, record, um, relying on him. I think Joe Bunner mentions it, right? One hit record is going to feed a thousand families, right? And that is true, that kind of saying, right? Not so many people are going to depend on him and now he's put in some position where everyone's kind of like scraping to kind of, you know, um, you know, put their lives back together again. Which is kind of sad, by and large. Um, sad way to end it. I'm hoping it's going to be a lesson learned for the kids coming up, but I, I'm, I assume not because I think some kids will think it's worth it. Some kids will think that they can kind of do it and not end up in trouble like Six Nine did. Some people, like everyone's got that kind of idea. Like, nah, when I come in, I'm going to do it better. I'm going to, I'm going to figure it out. But I think, by and large, when you mess with the streets, there's only one way it can really end: um, death or jail, for the most part. And unfortunately for Six Nine, it's going to be jail. Um, so that's that. What else? Let's move on, move on up and get a little bit nicer environment now talking about. Let's see what else is on docket here. Oh, 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 oh. 
James Charles Birmingham shutdown over the weekend. Over the weekend. Over the week. Over the weekend. Over the week. Or whatever. A week ago. Uh, James Charles, a very popular um, YouTube makeup artist. Even I know about him. Um, even outside of the brunette, kind of uh, telling me about him all the time. But a really popular YouTuber. Someone that's kind of I quite enjoy watching his videos. Even though I don't care about makeup. I think he's he's very entertaining. He understands that medium really well, considering you know um, the amount of makeup artists on there that kind of drone on and on and on about their lives, about actually getting to the actual makeup side of it. But he's actually super talented amazing guy and by and large i really enjoy his content um he was in he was in birmingham for the launch of his new uh palette i think i think he launched it at sephora and he shut down the fucking shopping mall in birmingham so much so that traffic was backed up for i think two hours or so um during the evening and you know um news outlets all over the country were out were outraged that this young man was this youtube star was kind of you know um fucking up their evening commute but james charles being james charles dealt with it in the most classiest way possible there's a video up here actually that um that kind of um, talks about the situation a little bit more but what it kind of you know honed into me was the real big uh conflict uh that's happening in media you know and all lands on across the whole spectrum of um professions or whatever it may be uh between the kind of old guard let's stop this between the old guard and the new guard the old guard really really does not understand and really kind of despises this whole new wave and medium of new stars that are coming out throughout the internet age especially when it comes to youtube youtube is one of those weird platforms where people the youtube that people that are youtube famous are really really famous not famous in the way that you know you'd be famous for starting in a movie or a tv series but famous in the way that like teenage kids are rabid fans of these people they chase them down the street they uh, meet them they form queues of hundreds of people to meet them at meetings greet they buy all their merch it's a kind of fame that's very um quantifiable right the likes and the views that you're seeing of people on youtube they translate into sales for tickets for merch for makeup they're real real fans right and the engagement is absolutely out of this world because for the most part youtube is one of the rare places where fans are really really um responsible for the success of whatever individual that's on that platform so if, if somebody's not as big as they should be on the platform, it's because they haven't necessarily gathered the fans that they need in order to kind of boost them, to kind of get them where they need to get to. But once you're able to provide the content that fans like and they can connect with you, they are going to do everything within their power to let everyone know who you are. They'll, they'll spread your stuff, they'll clip it, share it on social media. Fans on YouTube are insanely cool. They're so amazing. And they're great at kind of really kind of propelling their stars to dizzy, dizzy heights. Of course, it being YouTube, it being on the internet, you can have your fans from all over the world, right? And they can kind of connect with you. And wherever you go in over the world, wherever you land, you've seen it with some of the biggest YouTubers, even like Jake Paul and Logan Paul, they're able to land wherever they want in the, across the world, send out a tweet, and they'll have hundreds of fans meet him up at a certain location. So James Charles is no different. He kind of did the same thing. But of course, there's a constant conflict happening at the moment with old media and new media because there's some there's a pop, there's a percentage of people out there who have no idea who these people are, right? Like I I being me being a good example, I am always on YouTube, right? But certain people that I might see at VidCon, where I see videos or I see the lineup of people that are talking on panel discussions, I have no idea who these people are. They have millions and millions of, of sub sub subscribers on the platform. So YouTube is such a big place that you can it's really hard to know who everyone is. So if you imagine if you're not involved, imagine if you don't give a shit about YouTube, you're less likely to actually have the understanding about it. But the James Charles situation has been even more funny because you've just seen how just the generational the generational battle happening in terms of like who gets who doesn't. And for the most part, the UK media did not respond that well uh, with James Charles appearing in the UK and shutting down an entire shopping mall. And this video kind of like you know sums up quite brilliantly. I'll play it here. <laughs> So, um, hi guys, if you don't know James Charles was in the UK, this video says. Uh, James Charles uh, posted on Snapchat that he was at a radio station was talking about him. Uh, 10 million. I don't think I get paid enough. 10 million? We're at 13, almost 14 million. Paid. I don't think so. Outside the building. Yeah, I've had 10 million social media hits He's in well. my Snapchat. Um, but his, oh no, I think he gets 10 million viewers. That's very different to hits. Uh, yep. There we go. So, what's going on? Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. What 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 does this say about fame in the modern? Because newspaper journalists usually, as a former showbiz journalist, I, I I cover fame. Why are why don't I know about James Charles? Given that I read every newspaper every day. Oh three. What an idiot, right? Imagine that news broadcaster saying, "Why don't I know about this big YouTuber, 
but I read all newspapers every single day. That sentence doesn't make sense. The reason why you don't know about it is because you read newspapers, you flipping idiot. And fame on newspapers and magazines, because I imagine I go to Lidl quite often to do my weekly shopping, and I always pass the magazine aisle, the magazine rack, and it's always not, I was always quite interested to kind of see the front pages of newspapers and to see the front pages of the kind of you know weekly kind of TV magazine things that people buy, and just to kind of see what the current conversation is on general general public celebrity news. And it's interesting because the celebs that you see on front of papers and news magazines are in no way similar to the celebrities you might see on social media. It's completely like chalk and cheese. They're not even in the same universe. So you might so people somebody that actually watches TV and follows all these what what reads newspapers on the way to work has always had a sun or a mirror in their kind of like that um, lunchroom at work or in their office wherever they may be. You're gonna be more receptive to a particular kind of celebrity you go to all the imagine this lbc news report probably goes to all the gold probably goes to all the no well not golden but all the red carpet events that kind of you know uh honor and kind of uh, award um the tv stars that we know and love right but youtube and social media and instagram fame is completely different world and of course what this says about fame as an lbc player was saying was that fame now isn't just what we see on TV. Isn't just what we see in movies. Fame is uh, being a micro influencer, an influencer, um, somebody that's an ambassador for a brand. That is fame. There's there's um, fitness people like Robin Robin in, in NYC, right? She's a a Peloton. I think she's a Peloton instructor too. She has loads of other running stuff, but she's probably one of the biggest social media influencers on on Instagram. And she's she, what she effectively um, does, you know, fitness, right? And she's got millions of followers on Instagram right and if you're not in that world you have no idea who she was but she's really really famous she might go to, she might be able to go to Westwood Shopping Center Westwood Westwood Shopping Mall and get stopped by loads of women and men like kind of wanting autographs and pictures with her because she's really you know um popular on that platform but what it's showing is like now we have celebrities we have actual celebrities now who operate in different kind of little uh subcategories right and if, and unless you're on those platforms you won't know who they are if you're reading newspapers and watching TV every single day, how are you meant to know James Charles? Because he doesn't come on those platforms. But the future is getting on social media, is getting on YouTube. You've seen the you've seen the shift that's happened nowadays. Look what's happened to Will Smith, right? The film before he got on social media kind of tanked, and then he decided to get on YouTube. He's goes on YouTube now. He's just, he's effectively a YouTube vlogger. So much so he was appeared on he appeared quite famously on the YouTube Rewind, right? Doing the whole uh, Marcus Brownlee thing, right? Look how big he's got now. He's understood. He's un even his team has understood what how necessary it is for him to live on these platforms natively in order for him to kind of garner the attention he needs to garner in these movies. You can't just appear on a billboard. You can't just appear on a poster on a thing. You have to be on social media. Even the Rock. Look at the Rock. Oh, so he's social media youth. Look at Kevin Hart. They've understood that you have to be native on those platforms to kind of garner the eyes and the ears for the things you want to do in the general public. And the general public now have also understood that there's other celebrities, other people you might need to look at that might exist on these platforms. And that's, you know, that's how it works. Three, four, five, six, oh, six, nine, seven, three. Because I, I feel very sorry for West Midlands police. How the hell could they have been known? Oh they my God! Know that this I was going to right? 8,000. I bet it's made it. You guys really really into your research on how powerful the sisters shop. are. That's not <laughs> on... Oh. Oh my god, you guys, the craziest thing just happened. So you just watched my Snapchat story of me and Cassie in the car with our Uber driver listening to that radio station host talk about the meet and greet yesterday saying how we had no idea who I was, how he was not sure why I was famous or why 8,000 people showed up and how it was crazy and like all this crap. And he asked people to call in on a certain number and give their opinion. So me and Cassie just thought it would be hilarious to try to call in. Our Uber driver got us the number. So we called and we got through. And I was like, hello, this is James Charles. Amazing, right? Immediately. So they did. And I just got a chance to literally talk to James O'Brien live on LBC, which apparently is like the biggest radio station here in the UK. I told him all about the sisterhood. He was so nice. He apologized for his ignorance. I said, it's okay, girl. Not everybody watches makeup tutorials, but everybody's going to be in the sisterhood one day. And I talked about our achievements and everything that we've done. And it was such a cool moment to kind of just talk about you guys and how amazing you guys all are and the turnout yesterday. Such a strange moment. Literally went from like listening to us on the radio to like <laughs> calling. <laughs> and that's amazing right that is a that is essentially the power of social media and the internet right he's able to kind of essentially the one of the biggest youtube stars able to kind of live stream um, his reaction to this this uh, radio host talking begrudgingly about his fame on snapchat to his host of thousands of millions of followers and in the same instance be able to kind of immediately react immediately tell his truth immediately get back on stream and clarify what he said in case they kind of clipped him on the radio made him sound crazy right 
And essentially, this is what real fame actually looks like. Because at the end of the day, as great on camera as James Charles is, right? What he's essentially famous for is being really fucking good at makeup. It's come back to the craft, right? Do you remember there was that era of like, you know, that post-fame era where the Kardashians came around and a few other kind of vapid kind of quote-unquote um, social media influencers came around and people kept gradually saying, but what's their talent? What's their talent? Well, now we're seeing it. We're seeing the convergence of like the talent of being somebody like a Kardashian or a Jenner where your talent is actually being able to garner attention um, on social media from just doing everyday things because I still think it's a talent I still think being a Kardashian is a talent I still think it's something that not everyone can do being able to constantly tweet constantly upload pictures of your life of your kids and all that shit is fucking tiring if you've tried to do it yourself uh, you'd know general public you know how hard it is but someone like a Kardashian to keep doing it again and again and again and again on, on top of every other business they do on top of every other ambassadorship they do it's fucking difficult on top of fucking Keep making yourself look attractive every single day, putting on makeup, working out, eating well, whatever it may be, not eating. It's all hard. Everything's difficult. So that is an actual talent. We've seen it because it's, you know, enough time has elapsed now where we know it's not just as easy as pointing a camera and like talking. Because if we, if, if that was a fact, then we would all do it. There's some people that are just talented that so the talent is evolving. And now we're also seeing on top of that, we're seeing people that are great on camera, great at social media, great at doing internet shit and they're talented. You're only going to win. It's only going to be a home run for you. And now we're seeing that at the end of, uh, on top of that with people like Jeffree Star and on top of it, great business acumen, right? Being able to kind of launch your own products and kind of satisfy a need or carve your own niche out there. Look at what they're doing. Look at what they're able to achieve. It's fucking insane. It's amazing. It's such a great time to be alive. And for anyone that wants to get involved, all you need is a phone. That's it. All you need is a phone. You need. You got your phone. You got an internet connection. You too can be on that same platform. You too can be able to prophesize and share your creativity with a horde of fans out there. Of course, if naturally, if you're talented, but you've got the opportunity to do it yourself. And that I think is one of the best times involved and available. And the fact that this LBC presenter James O'Brien doesn't have a clue and doesn't get it is great because eventually he's going to have to get it, or he's going to lose his job. That's essentially how the evolution of time evolves. That's how things go on. You either kind of get on board with what's going on or it dies. It's even, it's quite actually interesting to actually think that radio actually exists in conventional sense nowadays anyway. Um, it's probably going to be one of the only old kind of like analog systems that's still kind of existing now in a kind of digital age. Similar to like record stores and that sort of malarkey. It's kind of weird to see there's, there's some things that still exist that can still survive. But I think by and large, the tournament's happening. We're seeing a lot more talk radio shows happening now, kind of in the same mode as podcasts. We see people kind of be able to talk freely on platforms like radio stations, more maybe without as many inter many commercial breaks as they did do in the past because of top podcast influences. Things are changing by and large, but I think now fame, the, the notion of fame has been changed somewhat, but we're all, we are seeing a bit like a bit of a return back to people that are famous for being actually good at doing something and i guess now we're seeing holding a camera to your face is a bit of a skill and we're also seeing that maybe applying makeup really fucking well is a skill too because you remember what makeup was like back in the day like people girls would die to have makeup to have like um catwalk ready makeup do you remember that was a thing no one even knew how to do like what is catwalk ready makeup it was all these hush hushy secrets like girls thought um there was a special kind of product you had to use to get a particular kind of look but then by and large slowly but surely people got more curious they got involved makeup artists kind of took a step back from the industry some people started putting fat phones in front of their faces started recording shit and by and large now all the secrets are out there, there is no kind of catwalk ready look you can get whatever ready look you want from the comfort of your own home if you're willing to follow a tutorial or two it's fucking amazing what a time to be alive man what a time to be alive anyway <laughs> what is next on the docket here ba, ba, ba. what else we have here Oh, Ketflix and Pills party. Yeah, man. Ketflix and Pills, my favorite um, clubbing um, nightlife culture meme page, had a party at Fold the other day. Fucking cool, right? They had a two-fold party. They had a party on the boat, I think, during the day, and then they had a party in um, Fold, which was an... And it was At the time, it was a secret location, but now the time has gone, so I can say it. The party was at Fold, and it looked fucking cool, man. It looked fucking amazing. What a great time to be alive again, right? An internet meme page does a fucking party. That is so cool. Um, I followed them for a while. I think you you may be familiar with it, Ketflix and Pills. They do great memes. I've got it here on the page. Um, it's a great actual name. Ketflix and, and, and Pills is one of the like you know interesting memes they have here. When your mate does the last line instead of splitting it in two, had not been allowed to slot you. Right? Just great memes all around. Mermaid meme. I've already given you two fat lines. Her. Huh? I want more. 
<laughs> right? When when you're when you're off, you're not trying to roll a spliff out the afters. Yeah, awesome. Just great, right? So, so they did like a little um party at Fold. It looked fucking amazing. I couldn't have a chance to go, unfortunately, because I was busy with other engagements. But it looked really, really fun. They might have some they might have some videos actually here of the actual occasion. Did they have any? Nope. No actual videos, but they got lots of fucking gear that they're slogging at the moment, which is fucking funny. But yeah, um, but she ain't messing with no broke that. niggas. Now I ain't saying she a gold that is so nigga. cool, no? Uh. So yeah, Kepix and Pills are fucking awesome. They're doing great stuff at the moment. I'm a big fan of them. I recommend you check them out. They did a party over the weekend. And maybe, again, another kind of resurgence, right? Internet meme pages coming up and hosting these um, rave events or club nights in general for people that are involved in clubbing culture. Because by and large, I think Boy Room has done quite a good job at kind of bringing that community together. I kind of went on a bit of a binge watching loads of old Deck Mantle videos, and that was quite sick. But by and large, it's, it's quite hard to form a community online of clubbers it's quite difficult. I haven't necessarily found it. We had quite, we had a, we had a bit of a of a community on Resident Advisor comments pages or the comment section, but you know, Resident Advisor and their infinite wisdom decided to kind of close the comments. Idiotic decision, but you know, what can they do? Um, now we've kind of seen a bit more of a, you know, people are kind of um, divulging a bit across to maybe Facebook. People will leave comments on there, but that's a whole cesspool. I'm not going to get involved in. Uh, the the Reddit page for Techno is quite good. The subreddit of Techno is quite cool, but it's quite hard to kind of cultivate a kind of community people that you kind of can talk to and kind of get friendly with over a couple of nights out but by and large um Kepix and Pills done a good job of doing it so far um and again by you know having these in real life events you know it's quite funny how everything's coming back around right internet meme or uh, Instagram meme page is now kind of taking that kind of same approach and then adapting it into club land by starting a club night and taking you know and bringing people out into real life events and that was one of great success and i'm sure they'd be able to do this all around all over the country if they wanted to but yeah that was over the weekend and that looked fucking fun as fuck but yeah big up big up uh Ketfix and pills um one of the best internet meme pages out there i recommend you check them out give them a follow what else is on the list here oh um there's this great actually um profile actually that I saw just now on the New York Times um profile in the Yard Theatre which is a nightclub that's based in Hackney that I've kind of gone to a few times it's a it's kind of a you call it a club and a theatre in one I was actually meant to put on a night there a few week, a few months ago but I kind of never got back to the person because I, I I never really I'm not really sure if I can put on an actual proper club night where you have to kind of get DJs in to kind of do it and do the whole actual promotion thing that's a whole different skill that I'm not sure I have anymore. But Yard do a great thing where they kind of uh, mold a bar and a theatre venue all in one. And of course, for young people in this kind of area of Hackney, they don't necessarily get a chance to go to the theatre because it's quite expensive. I think there was a, uh, a story I saw the, just today in the morning on the front page of the Times about a particular theatre performance happening at the Royal Opera House where the tickets are going for like £3,000 or something, right? So um, theatre can kind of outprice the younger demographic, but the Yard are doing a good job of kind of bringing that in. Um, to kind of an affordable range. I think the tickets for the yard are, are priced no more than £20. Um, and the uh, New York Times kind of featured them in this amazing kind of op-ed that kind of, uh, oh, article that kind of talks about um, its relationship to the area, the founder that kind of founded it, the idea that goes around it. I recommend you check it out. It's really, really good read. It kind of goes into the whole details around it. It's a great little picture uh, kind of showing um, where the yard is in situ of Hackneywick. But yeah, that whole area is one of my favorite areas to go out in. Like I mentioned previously, like the mixed garage, uh, the yard, uh, they've got the crate around the corner that's great craft beer and has an amazing pizza that whole trifecta of venues is fucking cool and then you've got uh, the White Post Cafe along the canal which is another great place too where a few of my mates DJ and work there um, that whole area is really really cool and I just wish I just wish I just wish really wish right the Hackney Council or licensing laws allow those venues to open up a bit later because the business will be fucking booming because as great as it is I think it mentions here that this place opened until 6 which it isn't really I think they have to have special licenses but for the most part because I'm free but it'd be great to have be have have the ability to go out in these kind of areas and stay out till six when the trains reopen anyway right that would be fucking awesome but they don't they all close at 3 a.m people that live there kind of complain about the noises but you know you're having people all burst out of the clubs at the same time all trying to get to the next after party or you know score whatever they want to score to kind of keep the night going and it's just pandemonium whereas if they kind of allow people to party 
um, like adults until 6 a.m. People will kind of like slowly but surely trickle out over a, uh, over a longer period of time and people be able to go home safely on public transport because that area is a bit dodgy in terms of getting back home. It's a bit of a bit of a dead zone after after let's say like 12 when all the last train stop. So it'd be great if they could do that. But you know, that boat's probably sailed. But yeah, this article is really cool. It really um, speaks really well about the whole idea behind the Yard Theatre. It profiles a lot of the people that are involved in it. That actually, this is the outside of the yard where I kind of bumped into uh, Jamie XX here. He was out there here with a few of his friends. Whenever I see Jamie XX in public, he's always with girls, which is fucking awesome to see. Someone, you know, he's quite shy and withdrawn and a bit geeky looking, but he's always surrounded by women, which is fucking nuts, which is so cool to see. I remember seeing him out there as well. And obviously they, they, they profiled Ben as well, who's in charge of all the programming there at the yard. So I recommend you check that out. A real nice feature on the Yard Theatre that talks about everything concerning East London and nightlife culture. Anyway, that is an hour we have there. I um, don't want to blabber any more than I have to because I'll be back again for another show tomorrow as per usual. Um, this has been the Excellent Zinger Show, episode number 153. Thank you so much for tuning in. It's been a pleasure to have the company of your ears. As per usual, for more information regarding more, check out my website, excellentzinger.com. I'm DJing this Friday, as I mentioned before, in uh, Dalston at the Free Compasses from 9 to half 12. So if you're in the area, check out my night bump. I'll have it here on the screen. You can check it out. I'll put a link in the show notes too for the Resident Advisor link so you can uh, have a little smooch. But my night bump is coming up this friday uh the 8th of february from 9 to 12 first heat in dawson so if you're in the area come have a bump come have a dance let's have a little singy song in it brothers but until then until then we will meet again tomorrow for another episode of the Zinger show and i'll see you again then take care guys and girls